Hello, and welcome to this third installment of the Carnicom Institute Disclosure Project produced by Transparent Media Truth. This conversation was recorded on November 5th, 2020, and is in response to the 70-minute introductory video concerning the work of Clifford Carnicom over the past two decades, as he has attempted to understand the existence of an anomalous airborne cross-domain bacteria that is the suspected cause of Mark Allen's disease. If you haven't already watched the introductory video, it will be linked to the show notes below and is a necessary point of reference for the following discussion. Also linked will be a 72-page transcript of a presentation by Clifford Carnicom that delves deeper into his research and provides links to pertinent research papers archived at the Car Carnicom Institute website. Part 2 of this series is also linked, which features a conversation between Clifford and Dr. Carrie Midday, whose interest in the subject stems from a deep knowledge of the transhumanist agenda prominent within some circles of the medical establishment. In this third installment, Clifford and I are happy to be joined by Dr. Robert Young, Dr. Judy Mikovits, and Attorney David Meiswinkel. Dr. Young is the author of The PH Miracle, who currently operates a health and wellness facility in Los Angeles, California. His medical expertise and decades-long experience with dark field microscopy provide the exact skill set Clifford is looking for to help propel his research into the future. Find out more about Dr. Young at drrobertyoung.com. With 30 years experience in the field of virology, Dr. Judy Mikovits also provides an in-depth perspective into the work of the Carnicom Institute. She is the co-author of Plague and Plague of Corruption and has first-hand experience confronting a medical establishment unwilling to accept the ramifications of the scientific method when pursued with strict integrity. Go to PlagueTheBook.com for more information about Dr. Mikovits's history and current projects. Finally, Attorney David Meiswinkel joins the show to provide a legal context from which to analyze scientific evidence for the existence of the cross-domain bacteria. David has run for governor and Congress in the state of New Jersey and has a decades-long track record using his legal skills to expose government corruption and defend human rights. You can discover more about his work at MeiswinkelForCongress.com. Together, these three represent exactly the type of brain trust Clifford Carnicom is looking for to propel the work of the Carnicom Institute into a new and upgraded Carnicom Foundation. While Clifford has managed the gargantuan task of discovering and isolating this bacteria, as well as collating and analyzing information from Morgellons sufferers, this work has thus far been done on a shoestring budget with limited resources. Next steps include sequencing the DNA of the isolate, creating the legal foundation and acquiring necessary patents, as well as pursuing a deeper understanding of the phenomenon of Morgellons disease, its symptomology, and developing more targeted treatment protocols. If you are interested in learning more about Clifford's work, helping to further the scientific and legal aspects of this transition, or simply would like to donate to the cause, please go to www.carnicominstitute.org. I will be the host of this discussion. My name is Doug McKenty. You can find more of my work, including the long-form interview podcast, The Shift with Doug McKenty, on YouTube and Facebook, at McKenty on Twitter, or find it on your favorite podcast hosting site. You can find all my work on the web at www.theshiftnow.com, including hundreds of hours of free content and over 120 interviews to date. Allow me to thank Rob Rubin of Transparent Media Truth for putting this all together. Find this and all other roundtable discussions at transparentmediatruth.com or contact Rob directly on Twitter at transparentmed1 or email transparentmediatruth at gmail.com. Without further ado, I want to welcome Drs. Young and Mikovits and Attorney David Meiswinkel to this third and final chapter of the Carnicom Institute Disclosure Project. Uh, that was a brief introduction to what Clifford's been working on at the Carnicom Institute for the last 20 years. Um, we're going to open it up for questions and, and answers from the panel, and I just wanted to reiterate one more time. If you wish to remain anonymous, please just stay muted. Um, there is uh, an opportunity to use the chat to ask questions if you're more comfortable with that. Uh, and if not, then uh, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself. I think we're going to remain relatively formal. I think 
uh, informal here. I think we'll just, if you have a question and you want to unmute yourself, then uh, then go for it and ask a question of Clifford and he'll be happy to answer. Um, and so uh, I guess we might as well kick it in. If anybody has a question uh, for Clifford, then uh, now would be the time. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this is Dave Meiswinkle here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, I can David. Okay, good. Uh, I'm an attorney, and uh, I'm here as an attorney. I'm also the uh, president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, but I'm not here as, as a representative of them, but I'm here as an uh, interested uh, citizen. Uh, Clifford, I have a number of questions. But the first was, the first I want to thank you for the work you've done. I mean, this, is, this seems to be incredible work. I know a little bit about it, so uh, I'm not a whole lot surprised by what you said, but you've taken it another step. Uh, in examining this uh, microbe, the Morgellons microbe, um, how would you describe it? Is there something uh, that would exist in a state between a, a bacteria form and a virus? Is it organic or is it synthetic? Is it, is it something, is this the only one of, of a kind that, that you know exists right now on the planet? <laughs> I see uh, down there, so I'm gonna wait for a second and find out if you can hear me first. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, and David, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah, okay. So, well, those are all three um, uh, interesting questions. Um, I'll start with the simplest, I think, at this point. At this point, I would, I would, I would not classify it as unique. I, I know of no other organism that um, is identified at this point that has these characteristics, their morphology. I, I, I see it as completely unique at this point. Um, number two, and, and you know, I find nothing in the literature um, that shows of its history at this point beyond that history now extending back close to 30 years, 25 to 30 years it's getting close to. Um, second, the organic versus synthetic. Um, all of the information that I have been involved in follows what I would call the the laws of nature and biology at this point. There are many people that seem to attribute, you know, art, artificial technology to it, uh, that somehow there's something mechanical or robotic about it. Such a thing may be, but I approach it from the, uh, the chemical, the biochemical standpoint, and I look for anything that I can that would indicate to the contrary. At this point, I have nothing that says it violates the laws of what I call nature and biology. That doesn't mean that there could not be a synthetic aspect to it. In fact, that, that um, idea should certainly be entertained. And the reason that I, I struggled with nomenclature for this particular organism is because it also doesn't it does not seem to fit classical biology uh, structure as i understand it that structure adopting the, the more recent uh, uh domain what they call domain architecture where life is now organized according to its genetic origin when i was in school my work was tied in taxonomy morphology you know you memorize forever trying to classify things by how they looked and how they were structured. Uh, the big advance and change that I see that has affected that interpretation is that of genetic origin. And that division is actually much simpler, as I understand. It breaks everything down into three, three uh, domains. And one of those domains will be the bacteria, another will be what's called ar archaea, and another will be eukaryotes. And the reason I struggled with I, trying to come up with terminology for this is because on the surface, when you would just say, I mean, I wrote a whole, I wrote a whole paper on how this particular organism satisfies the attributes 
of a bacteria. There is a significant uh, uh, set of attributes that say, hey, I'm dealing with a bacteria. But when you look at other aspects of it, namely its ability to survive in what I would call very adverse and hostile envir environments, I have to bring in what I understand to be the characteristics of the archaea. Archaea are, are, are and, and this is one of three primary domains. And, and life as we know it, certainly as I understand it, is it, it's to be one of these three domains. That's why the structure was created. It says we've got these three different levels going on, and you're in one of those categories. When you start to raise the prospect of something crossing over between that, well, at the very least, I'm so diplomatic, but at the very least, that merits investigation. If somebody is even beginning to suggest that, then it merits a discernment as to whether or not that's really the case. But the ability uh, at this point, the organism, I, I actually, you know, other than maybe the furnace approach, I haven't done, I haven't done that. But uh, uh, this organism ap appears to have the ability to survive and exist in extraordinary environments. Uh, that statement about without an atmosphere is, is not far-fetched. Uh, I've certainly done work in a, in a, uh, a near vacuum environment. Uh, I've certainly done work that examines dormancy, that environmental filament that I told you about was the EPA. I still have an original part of that sample. The material is, what, close to 15, 18 years old. It's actually close to 20 years old, right? I know that I can take a portion of that sample and start the entire culturing process from it 20 years later. Okay. So, so, so the archaea are to be entertained. The bacteria have a whole set of uh, attributes. You know, one real basic one would be like gram negative. I've done tests that say, hey, this is gram negative bacteria. So somebody else might stop there, but I can't stop there because the, the growth characteristics that is exhibited, and this can be demonstrated in a culture environment, to me, they step beyond, they clearly seem to step beyond the bacterial world. If you have filaments, you know, the most common interpretation of that would be in the, in the fungal world, I think. I think you'd have a hard time uh, saying that that would be at least expected and more common. Um, and you have some rather complex structures that uh, develop that, that go completely outside the, the normal interpretation of, of photobacteria by size alone. I mean, you have transformations of morphology that take place that are very significant. And so they don't seem to fit. You also have some really unusual work that took place in what I call early years that involved blood cultures. And I have to say, that work is strange. It, it is strange what it says. And it says that, uh, it says that there were interactions that took place between the filament form, and I know that the quote uh, bacterial form, cross domain CDB, whatever you would like to call it, resides within the filament form. So there were interactions that took place in a cultured environment between those forms and blood. And uh, you know, this business of science, what, what we regard as science fiction in the end. You know, you can look at Star Trek for that, but eventually what we can conceive of in our mind usually actually takes place in some way, in some time. And, you know, I remember when I wrote that paper, the idea that blood would be involved would just be, you know, you'd be considered to be out there. But darned if you won't read a year or two later, you know, that artificial blood is in the making. This stuff is, it's like we're making things nowadays, okay? And we're at the point of making blood. And the military aspect was a big part of that. And you'll find a footnote on one of my papers where DARPA or whatever released their, their statement about what they're doing in biology. And we are definitely at the level that we wish to design, engineer, and modify biology at the deepest levels. And this is why, and I'll try to end this fairly soon, this is why I think at this point of knowledge, it is absolutely no stretch whatsoever to consider that the knowledge base to transcend the so-called domains of biology, let's say, is very likely an active enterprise. 
I, in terms of the human mind and what we seek to do, if I had the resources and I had the motive, I would do it. If somebody told me these are the three domains and you give that as a playground for somebody that has resources and tools to do things, guess what they're going to start asking? They're going to ask, do you think it's possible that I might be able to span uh, the, uh, the characteristics of these three domains and, and possibly um, across the boundaries? We, CRISPR thing, the business of, you know, we're at the point where genetics is, is equated to a word processor, you know, cut and paste. This is the world we're at. Can you even begin to say that you don't think that it would be now entertained, that we would be attempting to cross these boundaries? And now we get to ask the question, does this particular microbe, has that already been accomplished in a way that was discovered in a way that I believe never was intended to be discovered? Did that happen in a public environmental sense well over 20 years ago? So I hope that answers that some. And you also asked uh, about a virus. Okay, what I have to say about the uh, question on virus, I simply have no means to examine a virus. My, my equipment, we talked about this a, uh, a little bit the other day, but I have a limitation with the equipment that I have. And my equipment, that limitation is what you'd call the micron level, just barely sub-micron. And the virus is down below me inside. I cannot see them. I wish that I could. I do wish I had more sophisticated equipment. But I operate essentially at the micron level. I also operate at the molecular level with infrared spectroscopy. Um, so I'm down smaller than the virus level, actually, in some ways. But I don't have that in-between stage of equipment. So I can't examine the virus. Um, but uh, so, so hopefully that's an answer uh, that uh, what's on the table here are the domains of life and the classification of this particular life form and the crux of the, the crux of this issue boils down to the absolute need to have the dna identified that is a crux to the many many of our questions it can be done. It took me months and months and months each time I got involved with that. I know the process can be done. I know my notes are in the in the library that I have. But and and my methods in many ways are relatively crude. I have to work at a level I can see things. Uh, so I'm saying that sufficient uh, cultural material can be produced where I've been able to extract DNA. But this is my answer. I mentioned this the other day. I want the answer to that. I want to know the genetic origin of this DNA, and then I want to carry on with some other discussions. And I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, always. <laughs> and more if you have. Don't hesitate. I, well, I have some more questions, or maybe somebody else wants to ask some. You know, what, here's here's. I, a, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, Clifford. I want to thank you for your uh, your presentation today. Um, I'm uniquely interested in in what you're saying, and and uh, very very impressed with uh, what you've accomplished so far. And uh, I know you need resources in order to make the rest of this uh, take place, uh, uh, and not just uh, money resource, but <clears throat> uh, equipment resource, and also people resources to uh, fulfill this. Uh, uh, this uh, dream as far as getting this uh, Morgellons ad identified, because I know we've been talking about it for several decades now. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but in 2014, uh, uh, ABC News actually did a report on it. Uh, it's uh, you, you can actually get access to that report and recognize the existence of chemtrails. Uh, that it was going on and uh, uh, brought it to the attention. Immediately stopped too. Uh, so this is not a this is not a uh, something that the public uh, that the uh, the bad actors uh, in the world and I'm sure we know who they are to a certain degree. But the bad actors do not want this information released because it's part of their overall agenda uh, for creating transhumans. And Morgellons is an experiment in creating transhuman uh, nature. And so they, they don't want it identified. Uh, uh, this is part of their overall plan for 
uh, depopulating the planet. Uh, and uh, you can say these are conspiracy theories. Uh, I call them conspiracy facts. Uh, the facts are this is their intention out of their own mouse. And Morgellons is just a uh, is just an airborne, um, like you say, is it uh, transmutation between or across transgenetics uh, between uh, man-made and 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 human or whatever animal or biological they've they've combined it with. Uh, that's that's yet to be seen, or maybe it's its own unique uh, 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 entity. Uh, that that has evolved, uh, but those are questions that uh, that I think you you probably have been wondering about, and and where I can help, uh, since I am getting some up to date samples of of uh, some of the chemtrail material that's coming around Houston. They're 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 carpeting Houston with chemtrails right now. Uh, I don't know what they have on on Houston, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's pretty ex, uh, extensive, uh, the amount of material that's available. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, looking at that uh, using uh, uh, compound microscopy, uh, much like you you have, phase, bright field, uh, contrast, uh, some dyes, what have you, to look at these particular entities. So I'm happy to share that information once I take the pictures and the micrographs. I'd I, I have studied, I've probably studied close to five or 600 th samples of blood. So I'm very familiar with the morphology of, of the blood, the anatomy of the blood, the physiology of the blood. And I think something that would really, really help you is, uh, is to get additional information because uh, the, blood, the blood chemistry is only 20% 20 per, 20 of the extracellular fluids. Uh, we're currently engaged in doing 100% of the fluids, both. Uh, uh, vascular and interstitial fluid. The only other capability that's out there is NASA. Uh, besides our lab, uh, we 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 have the capability to test the biochemistry of the interstitial fluids. And in any of these cases, and we're looking at both of them, the precursor to all this is going to show up in the interstitial fluids before it shows up in the vascular fluids. So this would be the genesis of, or or the the septic tank of where most of this. Uh, information can be derived uh, there in 80% of the extracellular fluids, which we can test for, and we are testing, because our work is mainly with, uh, uh, with hard-to-solve hard cases dealing with uh, untreatable cancers, which we've been uh, highly successful at. Uh, so, you know, but my curiosity is quite peaked uh, at anything that's unresolved. Uh, so it's uh, you know, that curiosity that drives me. Uh, and also, I, I personally don't think there's any hope in, until, you know, there's some upheaval to those who actually control things. The people that are, are controlling, uh, you know, the financial world, the, the, the science world and what have you, uh, they're controlling what information, the media, what have you. They're all the same people. And they do not want, uh, they, they don't care about humanity. Uh, they don't care about people dying. In fact, that's exactly what they want happening. And, and I think it's the main purpose for the, the chemtrails. Uh, it's not just an experience, experiment, but they want to see, you know, what levels of, of eugenesis that they can do on the human race, which is their goal is to take out seven, seven billion people or more. Uh, but the bottom line here is I, I'm, I, I, I would ex expand your, your list to include not just vascular fluids, uh, uh, but to include an interstitial fluid as well as intracellular fluids. You need that to really document the efficacy of, of uh, what is really going on. And you're going to find more information as it relates to validating uh, this particular whatever transmutation it is. Uh, bacterial, you know, human DNA or RNA or or synthetic. Uh, here again, I think it has all those components to it, uh, which makes it unique. Uh, but but here again, it's you know I'm not making a definite statement. I'm just making a, a comment based upon 
you know, what my investigation, and I have to admit, it's nothing close to what you're doing. So I appreciate all the hard work uh, that you've put in, and uh, you're making it a lot easier for putting a team together to to take this to the next level. And I'm just uh, uh, suggesting that if you would like my help, I think uh, I can be a, a huge help to your to your team that you put together. And I also know some financial people that may want to put some funds behind this who are actually investigating the people in Houston who are giving me this information, you know, manage quite a bit of money and be willing to maybe look at your website and look at your findings. And hopefully we can put together some financial uh, means to, to, you know, to, to do everything that needs to be done here. As far as it being accepted, it being published or being accepted, I, I think that's a life and death question. Uh, you know, I, I, anybody that's involved in this project, I would suggest uh, is putting their life on the line, uh, especially if they, they want to push it to the public, uh, uh, to the public level. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very dangerous subject uh, from my perspective. But, of course, that's the world I live in. You know, so I, I'm used, I'm used to it. I'm, I'm used to, I mean, my medical director was, was assassinated and, uh, he was taken out a year ago, medical doctor. He was in the secret. His name is Dr. Ben Johnson. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, for, to all of us, you know, you, you have to know what you're, you, you're getting into here when you're talking about Morgellons. Uh, this is not just to be taken lightly. This is serious, serious, serious stuff. Uh, and you're not taking on CDC. You're talking. You're ta you're taking on the people that run the CDC, and it's it's not our government because you're taking on people uh, that uh, are a lot more powerful uh, than the CDC or even our even our own government. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of money behind this, and whatever their intentions are, uh, all I can do is is look at the actions. Uh, but they're shadowed. Uh, they surely know who I am. You know, they, uh, uh, so, you know, and, and uh, but I'm, the thing is, is, is I'm here to help any way I can. And uh, I'll be happy to send you some samples. If you want to go to foreveryoung.com, my blog, and put in uh, Kim Trails. I don't have a lot of articles on it. I've got three articles. They're older articles, uh, maybe of use. Uh, but recently, it's interesting that this subject has come up because I'm just getting back into the game uh, with with the with working on Margellans, and then all of a sudden you showed up, and I I volunteered to say, yeah, I, I want to help, you know, any way I can. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I in looking at your in your blood samples, just to comment on that, uh, the blood cells, uh, those are identified as codocytes. Codocytes are hemoglobin deficient cells. We see that come up with uh, particularly electromagnetic poisoning where the, the uh, hemoglobin is wasted. So to, to separate he, uh, EMF from this particular organism. And then I saw the other cells, which I call the corona effect. I, I see that with also electromagnetic uh, poisoning as well as lactic acid and citric acid poisoning. Uh, so, you know, doing the chemistry on this is really important. Uh, so, uh, and not just the vascular fluids. Here again, they, they, the body tries to keep them pretty pure. The interstitial fluids is not the case. So uh, in any, any serious illness, particularly the symptoms that you've mentioned, that all represents... Uh, that we've got anywhere from a, a 0 0.5 to a, a, a up to a, a 1.5 defi deficiency in the pH of the interstitial fluids. Of course, you go into a coma at, at 7.1, and uh, but in all cases, uh, even in Morgellons, in cancer, any degenerative condition, uh, you will find. Uh, decompensated acidosis of the interstitial fluids of the interstitium. You'll also see an effect, which you may already know, on the uh, uh, the nucleus uh, totalis uh, solitaris uh, astrocytes or brains, uh, the 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 cells, the columpa cells, which 
or the bundle of cells that manages homeostasis, which manages the central nervous system and, uh, and its functionality, uh, this is always suppressed. And Morgellons could be part of that as one of the contributing factors. I would not rule that out at all, as Morgellons is a contributing factor as well as air pollution and nano, nano, from nano uh, pollution uh, from uh, the biolog not the biologicals, but the chemist, uh, the acidic chemistry of food that we're eating now and the different chemicals we find in water, a combination of three or four things that is contributing to many of the symptomologies that I'm seeing uh, across the board. But we treat for everything. Uh, we, uh, and what we treat, of course, is, is, is from our, our perspective, we're not treating the disease, we're treating the symptoms. And we base that symptomology as pollution and the solutions. And Morgellons can be part of that. That has to be eradicated. And so we're focused more on the interstitial fluids than we are the vascular fluids. But I think that's where I can lend some, some help uh, since we have the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the equipment, the technology to test uh, all, all the body fluids, uh, we can also not evasively test all the vascular fluids, 170 parameters. So we can get information really quick. Within about a half hour, I can know all the pH, pHs of the of the body. I can know all the the loads and and anybody that you think may be affected by this Morgellons. I mean, I'm interested in testing it. I'm interested in getting samples, blood samples. I'm interested in evaluating that and, and actually testing it, quantifying it, as well as qualifying it. So I don't, I don't know if that can be of help to you or not, uh, but I think you might find the information. We're also, by the way, using ultrasound. We're probably the only, only uh, diagnostic lab in, in, in the United States, maybe in the world, that's doing full body diagnostics, not evasive. So we are using ultrasound. And... Uh, Dr. Galena Magalco, who's who's a medical doctor and uh, who's now left the reservation, or she's off the reservation. Uh, she's <laughs> she's uh, doing great work and in, in helping to validate these things. So anything that we can do, because we're a small group of people and we don't have the resources that uh, it's not Big Brother. It's I think it's it's Big Father or Grandfather anyway. Who's over all this? Uh, uh, that's uh, really pulling the strings. I, I mean, I don't. I don't think anybody here thinks that just what we hap just what happened on November third is is uh, normal. There's nothing normal about what happened on November third. But it just shows, uh, uh, you know, you know the, the the war that's going on, and and uh, by exposing Mogellans in any way, I mean. I, I think we can get this this stuff published. I don't think that's a problem. We're not going to get the Lancet, but uh, we, we can get some peer-reviewed journals that will look at this. Uh, once we get all of the information, we can publish this, and then and then it's uh, just see what the fallout is from it. So uh, I just want to congratulate you uh, and your uh, on your dedication, your commitment, and want to thank you for your selfless. Um, contributions in trying to answer very difficult questions, particularly, you know, since, you know, all the uh, social media is full of mystery and conspiracy to truly, really, you know, put some real science behind this. Uh, but uh, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that there is an organism, you know, what it, what it's made up of and, and where it lives. I think we, we need to, we need to look at some of the other, uh, areas of the body that we can test for. Yeah. So that's all I had to say. I thanks again for your presentation. I look forward to reading more of your work. Th thank you very much, Dr. Young. I appreciate you being here and I appreciate your comments. And um, it's really exactly what this meeting is about. Um, it's, it's fair to say that I am at a crossroads in my life. Um, there is a, a limit to what be, can be accomplished in this particular environment that I established. And um, the, the reason for this disclosure project is that it is appropriate, it is necessary, um, it is time to basically transition what has been accomplished here to a, a broader uh, base of which um, your interests, I, I hope, can be a part of that. Uh, I, I think this is where it has to go. Uh, my role is actually very likely to be very different. I, I think 
probably one of the ways that I'll be most helpful in the future is to help people uh, be able to read my handwriting. Uh, I, I think this is uh, the crux of it in terms of what I can help people with now. And um, I don't know that that would be accomplished without my help. So I know that that's one thing I need to stick around for. Yeah, you should you should see my handwriting. You think yours is bad. <laughs> I, oh, by the way, I, I wanted to comment on your intelligence. Have you looked up the word in the Oxford Dictionary? You might find that re really interesting. Intelligence. Inter means, uh, 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 in inter means between, and gents means line. So intelligence is, by my interpretation, is being able to read between the lines. And so uh, you can look at the lines and study them all you want, but you got to look between it. I think what's and that between the lines is what's happening in the environment. So a textual approach, I believe, is is, is important. You can do you can do both, you know, you can do both. But I think you have to look at the context uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Thank, thank you. Um, go ahead, Doug. Is Doug still there? Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm just, uh, we have one guest that's on the phone, and uh, if she has questions, maybe she could text those questions to either Rob or I. That might be the easiest way, because um, every time I try to unmute her so she can talk. Well, there. Do you have a Does question? Does that work, Doug? Yeah, that's, that's good, as long as you can unmute uh, when you're not talking. But if you have a question, please... Yeah, what I really wanted was to you know, thank you, um, Clifford, for the presentation. I, I saw it last night, and I listened today as I drive with Judy Mikovits, and and I really wanted a little bit more. In fact, uh, Dr. Young just um, basically said what I was going to say first, but information about what you call, you know, the nose and, and, and what I call tissue reservoirs. Um, so the composition of those reservoirs as far as cell type, cellular composition, or, or even microbial composition, um, a lot sounds a lot sounds like you know Borrelia in the various forms of cis things where they can live in very unusual environments as well. So um, I just you know thinking thinking about that and and all of the work I've. I've studied and seen over the last decade on Borrelia and Borgellans, um, just uh, trying to get a more of an idea about, yeah, don't look necessarily in the blood, and but in the tissue reservoirs and the, and the components, the, um, the cellular components, um, uh, either whether it be immune and, and um, Dr. Young mentioned the, the astrocytes and, and, and the um, oligodendrocytes, and I wondered a little bit more about the lipid component, and would love to get my head around the, the um, iron um, dysregulation, but I've <laughs> been trying to do that for a little while, and I'm still not there yet. Um, I don't have any, uh, I mean, I don't have necessarily resources to help you, but throughout my work um, in, in the retroviruses um, over the decades, I, I can identify a lot of um, patients um, and, and appreciate your compassion for them. So if you need different kinds of samples and patient samples, um, I, I, we've seen a lot of exactly who you're talking about and the analysis doesn't fit into retroviruses solely necessarily or Borrelia or um, whatever, which is of course why Morgellons Morgellon gets you know, a different name, which doesn't really help because we don't we don't appreciate the interplay between the microbiome and microbiome and um, human immune and endocannabinoid system, which is pretty much where I focus. So I I need to dig into that research library of yours and appreciate you making it available. Um, to just simply ask of what I I I heard you know, the, the level of the microscopy and, you know, wish I could put some of them to it, but nobody talks to me anymore. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, 
yeah, that's my biggest question is about the reservoirs, the tissue, cellular, uh, the, the, the reservoirs, and the composition of the reservoirs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Markovich. I think I'm pronouncing that correct now. Is that correct, Dr. Markovich? Thank you very much for being here today uh, and, and the sort of extra effort it took on the phone here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just a couple of comments uh, real quick. Uh, one would be that I, I think a very sensible place to start in terms of trying to get, uh, you know, once let's say that you do actually have DNA information. Uh, that's fine. That's necessary. That's a uh, given to me. It has to be done. But the the culture work is significant, and and there is there is a repeatable significant mass, okay, of growth. There there are uh, identifiable repeatable forms of growth uh, that can occur in fairly significant mass levels. Um, that to me. Um, well, let's put it, put it this way. I, I think what I see in the cultures, I expect to see in the body. I, I think there are other things that may develop eventually from extended culturing. But what I see growing is what I expect to see in the body. And um, that, to me, is a, is a place that we should start, at, at least with an anticipation or expectation that there will be uh, parallels. Um, and this is where I would go. I, I unfortunately don't have the means to cut myself open and make that inspection, but uh, that's what's coming. That is what's necessary as an, an extraction. Uh, certainly, I have an interest in the same way you do in, in basically trying to conjecture what the composition of what I'm calling these nodal centers in. I, I would hazard a guess based upon the on the culture results, but we're not going to really get that answer until we get uh, in internal information. Also, another comment that I, I want to make is what, regardless of what resources any individual has or, or the problems that we're going to face, the real help that I'm asking for here is communication. I'm asking for assistance in communication. And I'm not, I'm not after the specific answers from any single person, because I think we're dealing with something that is much broader than it should ever be assigned to or, or expected from an individual. What I really need is those people of knowledge and, and influence, as well as compassion, to serve as communicators to others. Th this is not my forte in life. I don't, I, but every two years now, I'm making a parting appearance. Um, this is not my place. Uh, I, I've done some things that I think are, are helpful, but my real need here is assistance in communication. And I, I do want to uh, give credit to Doug and Rob and, and Noah for what they're doing here. But, but the starting point is this panel to me. I'm asking, I'm asking for help in terms of giving the word in a way that um, is is accepted as credible and and worthy of a person's time to to begin to get the answers we're after, and so my expectation is not with any any single person here. And I've also admitted and said I'm at a crossroads. It's different for me, folks. The best I can do is I will I will help interpret what it is I've provided because that actually could be difficult at times. But I'm after help. And this whole thing, if you look into this project I tried to, tried to create called the Community Health Professional Network, that was my attempt. That was a dream of saying, hey, folks, all your professionals, get together. Let's start talking. But it is, I simply cannot do it. As an individual, I'm, and my life is changing. Okay? My health has been an issue itself. Uh, I cannot just, we cannot just act like life will carry on in the same way. It's not going to. I'm looking at future generations well as much as I'm looking at our lifetime right now. And I'm asking for help in, in, in talking to other people about the significance and reality of what is taking place here. And for that, I would be immensely grateful um, if I ever heard of connections being made to other people that have uh, knowledge, influence, and compassion about the realities of our discussions, that is of the greatest importance to me.
Well, Clifford, I, I'm in. You've got you've got uh, my support. I, I'm happy to send uh, any micrographs you want to view. I mean, I could bring up hundreds of them. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that may or may not be uh, an example of vas uh, more gelins in the vascular fluids, uh, even in the interstitial fluid. So the, um, you know, uh, I, I would like your comments on some of these uh, these uh, these pictures that I'm taking. Uh, you know, it's not malaria. It's not flarium. Flarium. You know, it's uh, uh, here again. Uh, these are uh, fibrous uh, living entities that are that are in the vascular fluids, and uh, and uh, they shouldn't be there. Uh, they shouldn't be there, and uh, so uh, I'm happy happy to send some of those. I, I've got anyone that needs samples from some of the uh, chemtrails. If you have a microscope, uh, Judy, I don't know if you're listening. Thank you for being on and all the good work that you're doing. Appreciate your your voice uh, for for good. And uh, yeah, so it's it's always yeah, I'm here. it's it's always it's always good to hear from you and and. Uh, we we need to get together. Maybe I don't. Do you have a, do you, do you have a microscope, or you say you don't have one now, or you don't have access? No, no, I, I don't have access to anything at the moment, but I could in the future because people are making right. some of these things available to me. So I can get you know I can help communicate and bring the network and bring some other um, you know some really fabulous um, people into this conversation. Now, I would like to show you some of the micrographs. Maybe uh, uh, you can uh, email, email me at phmiraclelife at gmail or any of you uh, if you want to if you want to view uh, some of these micrographs that I have that I'm taking from some very sick people. Uh, we're not talking about flukes here. They don't look like flukes. Uh, uh, here again, it, it's something that's in the blood that's that uh, it, it are, are filaments. Uh, that uh, that are running, and you're you're saying you're saying they're approximately uh, one micron. These are a lot larger than than one micron, so uh, uh, or less. These these are a lot larger, so they may be something parasitical. So, uh, but I've got some of this material for uh, Clifford. If you want some of the material, I'll send you. I'll have uh, my source in Houston who's collecting this for me, because I'm actively engaged in trying to get to the bottom of this. And I, like I said, I, I had started this project with a patient who's been studying Morgellons for years, and but he's not a scientist, he's a financial guy, but he's just really confused about these snowstorms over Houston, and he's been collecting the material. Uh, and uh, so I've got some of that coming up, which I'll share with you or Judy or whoever's got a microscope, okay? Or whatever kind of microscope, if you want right. to look at this stuff. Uh, I'm happy to share it with you if you're interested. Can I? Yeah, I'd love to see the picture. And while we have you, Judy, um, I think one of the big steps would be for Clifford to be able to get these DNA samples that he's isolated sequenced. What does that require? You're probably the, you know, the person to talk to. I, I guess I, I get that you don't have access personally right now, probably to a lab that could do that, but. Um, what would that not, take? Not right. Yeah, the sequencing, you know, it's, it's not difficult. It's pretty simple. And I do have some connections with people that have connections. Um, and, and that's the, the good news about the, the pandemic and the nightmare of all of this is, is people have come back to me and offered me things. So I, I'll dig in right to that. That's the most important thing that has to happen. Let's get some sequences of both protein and DNA sequences. Let's understand the composition of the lipid component, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. Excellent. Okay. What? One thing I'm after is just an add-on. Am I coming through or not? Yeah, Judy. Yeah, I can hear you. Can yeah. you mute? I'll mute you're... again. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there you, you go. You know, one thing I'm after here is I'm after creating a network. I have been for many years, but again, it's not realistic to expect things to happen at this place. I'm 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 asking for a network of professionals to establish themselves 
in a way where the work can now be carried on to the next level. And it's not going to happen here. That's just the honest answer, not at this point. It, it, at some point, there is a need for a network, ideally a facility, but a form of collaboration that's taking place. And I'm going, I'm going to help. Like I'm going to help explain my work uh, when it's needed. But the culture I'm, culturing I'm talking about, it would take me, I'm headed to the desert, folks, in a few days, and I'll be there for several months. I won't even be here, okay? My life is changing. But it would take me weeks to get the culturing process back in place, uh, realistically, maybe, maybe several days, but to get that process in place. The culturing process needs to be set up independent from what I have here. It needs to also be demonstrated, uh, the repeatability claims I'm, I'm making, right? You've got to demonstrate that that's the case. And then, and then the, the, if we're all in agreement in terms of what's happening, then you proceed to the next step and you go to the DNA extraction. But really the work, we need to think of the work being done in a, a credible, uh, accepted environment involving a network of professionals that are knowledgeable in the field and willing to put their name on the line to do the work regardless of what somebody's opinion is. And we need to think outside of Carnegie Institute as being now the source. So CI has been the source of a body of information. But it's not that I don't want to help. It's that this is bigger. This is bigger than here, a lot bigger than here. You know, Clifford, I, uh, I'm listening to uh, Judy Mikovits and, and Dr. Robert Young. Uh, it seems that the components to help you as far as the communication is to get the word out. I mean, you've done the work up to a point right now, and you're expressing you need assistance or other people to pick up the baton and carry it, or the, the torch and carry it. But it it, it seems that there's so much work that you've done and you have such a history that like uh, Judy did with her books, The Plague and the Plague of Corruption, she gained a lot of notoriety and a lot of credibility. And it seems that it was Dr. Young said, this is a dangerous situation. And it is for everyone because of what's behind it. But it seems to be, at least in my experience, that that you shine some light on it that you have you are less danger, that this is an important material or subject matter that the public should know about and they don't know about it for the most part. They won't know about it unless somehow it's published in, in or in, in video form or however. And you can do that up to now. You may need someone because you're so voluminous to help you streamline it maybe professional writer to help you assist but i think you could do that you could have, have your struggle back in 1999 when you first noticed and did the started doing the air sampling up to now the morgellons and you can have special chapters on the morgellons maybe you could talk to some of the, your patient or not patients but the people you work with who have are afflicted by this and get their cooperation get their quotes get their uh, maybe some of the photographs that they might allow you to use uh, their permissions so you get the word out. And uh, you, you said that a number of them are sort of like on their last breath now. They want you to help them out in some way. Well, this may be the way to tell their story. They can't tell their story, or if they only do, everybody makes fun of them. But you you deal with them in a serious way, and you appreciate their pain. So, I mean, you have the pain, too, in a different way. So I, I think in the communication here, you have Judy Mikovits. I mean, if you wrote a book and she gave you an introduction to it or Dr. Young did the same thing or on the on the flap, they signed it. And I've read this material and, you know, this is what I think of it. And, and uh, I think that would go a long way to establishing the credibility. So you have a gem right there. It's what you've done thus far. You've got to put it in a form, I think, into a book form and and uh, and allow some of the people on this call to help you get it out and uh, and see where it goes. But uh, a lot of people don't know about Morgellons. You know, uh, they don't even know about chemtrails, even though they've been experiencing it for 20 years or more. Right. Uh, so, I mean, 
but the Morgellons is even more specific. And, and I want to ask you some questions on that, but that's in, in reference to the communication and what you want to do. And, and I don't know what's going on in your life that, you know, makes it at this point in time, you're drawing a line here. So, you know, there's personal things going on. It's none of my business. But as far as your work is valuable work that should be exposed to the public. And in that book, you can give your references. You can give your, you know, your websites and stuff like that. And you have a lot of freedom to express yourself. And I'm sure there are, are very good writers that would help you if, if you needed some help to, uh, you know, con condense it. And I think there, right on, like I said, on this call, there are some people that will be willing to help you uh, scientifically. And the two scientists that were talking, I mean, I'm very impressed. All right. Thank, thank you, David. I will help in any and all ways in working with people um, that I am convinced are acting in the public interest. I will help in all ways that I can with those that are acting in the public interest and serving the public. Uh, because of uh, experiences I have had, uh, I will not be uh, uh, seeking a relationship with an individual or a business um, uh, for the sole interests of that business. I will, I will need to be convinced and will be convinced that they, if they are acting in the public interest, they are going to have whatever level of help that I can provide. And that includes everything that you've just mentioned. What you'll notice in, you know, I had this proposal, right? Uh, two years ago, I said, hey folks, it's time. Uh, it's time to make a change. Yeah, we need money. And here is an outline of the most rudimentary plan you could possibly imagine, uh, what was called the foundation proposal. And you'll notice one of those 12 main segments, it's a book. It's a story. Two years ago, I, I publicly said, yeah, the story needs to be told. Um, it's true. I, I, I would solicit all the help I could get, again, under the condition that they're acting in the public interest. And yes, I would need writers. I need everybody. Uh, it's, I need everybody. The, the budget of, I mean, just imagine it. Imagine that you have <laughs> yeah, a, a nonprofit, primarily the actual scientific work being done by one person and, and some uh, people that have assisted in extremely valuable ways so you can even get the information. And and the budget, the, if, you, if you even want to call it that, the budget that goes along with uh, this operation and facility, contrasted against a... A, a pseudo misrepresentative study by the CDC involving essentially billions of dollars accessible to them. And the truth is I've needed my own CDC for 20 years, except I've needed an honest one. And I don't have it. I need all the help we could possibly imagine, but it needs to be outside of me and I will help in any way. And you're absolutely right. Communication is at the heart of it. It hasn't been my strength because I was censored long. I do believe everybody can have their opinion. I believe that censorship actions were up against me a long, long, long time ago. See, that would be a chapter in your book. What you need or what you've experienced as far as the censorship and what you need as far as to take the next step and an appeal to the public, you know, and to other experts to examine your work. I agreed. Agreed 100 percent. In fact, it's probably one of the first times I acknowledge with a, it might be in the actual proposal, but it's certainly with a couple of uh, associates that I talked about the book idea with. There is a very human side to this story, too, right? It's not all science. And there is a story. There is a story also that goes along with Carnicum Institute. And the story does need to be told. Yeah, Clifford, there's the uh, uh, option of a documentary as well. Um, you know, that's just another way to get the word out, a, a book and a documentary. Um, you know, maybe it could be something that we could be thinking about in the next year. 
or something like that, um, I'd certainly be willing to help with that because that sounds like a, a fascinating project. And I think there's a pretty important subject. Um, so just another thing to put on the list, I guess, but we can, you know, as we continue having conversations, uh, it's just another option. I, I'm accomplishing my goal when I listen to you folks. Today. Mm-hmm. I'm accomplishing my goal in the sense that I want you to be thinking about where we go and this is what's happening. And truthfully, I, I don't, it's been a, it's been a challenge, a real battle. I don't know where it will go. Um, I've seen potentials of seeds of communication in the past. I've seen seeds of assistance to the public in the past. I've seen seeds of financing and funding in the past. Uh, I've seen claimed interests supporting the public's needs. I've seen these things. I don't know where this will go, but I'm here and you're listening and I'm noticing you're starting to talk a little bit. <laughs> like right. there's a little bit, there's a little bit going on. I was saying, wait a minute, there's somebody else here that just might have an interest in this and might actually be able to do something. That's what means the most to me and what we're doing right now. Yeah, I mean, it sounds you know we've got a we've got a number of people already that are that have the kind of expertise that is exactly what you're talking about in terms of uh, not only verifying the work you've already done, but um, you know helping to move it on into the future uh, and get a more detailed scientific explanation of of your observations. Um, so you know, this is a great start for me. I'm actually kind of excited, and it and just to get all these people together. Uh, with the level of expertise that we've had uh, between the people that showed up yesterday and today uh, to be able to have these conversations and get a lot of different um, perspectives. Um, And I mean, this is a really important topic. I think anybody that's uh, into getting news and information alternative from what you're hearing from the corporate media uh, is going to be interested in getting this information and understanding because I think that a lot of what you're working on is 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 a big part of the the puzzle. And if we want to understand the big picture of what's going on in the world today, we need to understand this cross domain bacteria that you discuss and the Morgellons disease that's associated with it. So, um, you know, I'm so happy that you're coming on, and I'm happy to have the opportunity. I think all of us at Transparent Media Truth to be able to help you put this together. But uh, if anybody else has anything to ask, um, you know, we can keep going for a bit. I don't know. Maybe it's winding down, but, um, you know, still willing to take a few more questions if uh, any of the panelists want to continue the conversation. Bring that up. I don't know. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I'd like to thank Clifford for his contributions over the years. And I think at the very least, the public is deserving to know some, to have some answers. And so that's what we support at Transparent Media is to develop this project to a point to where we can find the prep, put the pressure on the powers that be to at least come forward with some answers. Cause I think that's what we're owed. And then from there, you know, maybe an action plan can develop, but we need the answers first. I think Clifford alluded to that yesterday a little bit about, you know, he'd like to get some basics first in terms of, you know, the research part of it. And I think that's what goes to the next level. And I think that's where it falls in the hands of the community from here, that we have to put the pressure on the power structure to come forward with those answers. But Clifford, thank you for your participation and all your contributions through the years. Thank you for being here as well. We're in it together. Yep. Yes, sir. All right. Well, if there aren't any further questions, uh, Clifford, I guess, do you have any closing statement or do you want to give out? I know uh, carnicominstitute.org is a place to go to find more information. That's Is that correct? People who want to, to understand more about this can get it all there. Um, yes, uh, we can mention that. I, I would, I, I would uh, identify it as a preliminary source of information in the modern world. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, uh, the website, carnicominstitute.org, not com, that'll be a shield site. Carnicominstitute.org does exist at this point in time. Uh, it is in the most rudimentary format. It is not meant for pleasure anymore. Um, it is meant simply as a download portal. Uh, maybe we, we talked the other day, and maybe there'll be some resurrection 
of the interface that makes it a little bit more convenient, but it's no frills at this point. And it's saying, get the information. If you have an interest, we'll go from there later, but let's get the information and get it uh, distributed is what it really is about. I, I simply would not count on the website. It may be there, but I simply would not count on it. And, and yes, it has meant a lot to me. That's why I've spent the last two or three years, especially working with a close associate of mine and um, staff, uh, tremendous effort has been put in place to develop a network of distributed information. And that hierarchy that I was speaking of is there. And, and we do need to think, whether it's five years, 10 years, or 50 years from now, you do not want the information lost. I'll tell you that. I don't think so. Uh, what, you know, maybe somewhere else it would have been done more efficiently in some kind of way. But the fact is it, took me 20 years to get the culture state at a point where I say, hey, this is in place and it works. So I wouldn't want to lose the information. So I hope that we will take advantage of it. Just start by acquiring the information, however inconvenient that is, just to acquire it and distribute it. And then we have things we can talk about down the road. So I want to thank everybody for, for being here. Uh, really great to, to see. Uh, genuine, genuine uh, interest in participation uh, by those people um, that uh, understand significance in our world and our times, to be able to recognize when something is important and worthy of their time. For that, I am immensely grateful. Thank you. And uh, Clifford, does it sound all right uh, with you? I, you've got the 72-page transcript that we sent to the panel members. Should we uh, post that with when we post these videos so that uh, anybody that watches this can have access to that information as well? Absolutely. That's a public document. Uh, okay. Everything is public now. But that's, Great. a, I think, an understandable, a little bit more of the lay side of Carnicum about trying to communicate um, that is freely distributed and and to be made accessible for everyone great so, yes, absolutely okay we'll we'll post that material when we post these videos and then in that transcript uh it it talks specifically about a number of the studies that you can find at carnicominstitute.com uh, excuse me carnicominstitute.org that's funny doug <laughs> right and uh and Very good. I like that, <laughs> and uh, and and you can read the read the studies. So start with the transcript, and then go uh, the reference to the studies. Go to uh, the website, carnicominstitute.org, and uh, and you can then download the studies. So they'll be on the internet in perpetuity, which is uh, part of the part of the point of all of this. So anyway, thank you very much, Clifford, for putting this on. Uh, I'll let people know if you want to catch uh, the other roundtable discussions, the other work we've been doing, and, and all of this uh, Carnicom Institute stuff will be posted on our website for Transparent Media Truth. That can be found at transparentmediatruth.com. And uh, so you can uh, get this and other information there. And thank you, Clifford, for uh, having us produce this for you. Very honored to get this information out. And thanks to everyone on the panel uh, for showing up today really appreciate your questions and um you know i'm really feeling like maybe we're building a little bit of a of a core group here that can help to get the word out and maybe take some of this uh this science to the next level where it needs to go so let's hope this is the beginning of uh, some really good work that we can do in this direction thank thank you very much Jack. Boom. thank you clifford thank you yeah thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody. Appreciate your participation. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Rob, Thank Doug. Thank, Thank you. 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 You bet. All the best. Ciao. So long. Now. Take care, everybody. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Well, all right, everybody. There you have it. That's the third and final installment of the Carnicom Institute Disclosure Project produced by Transparent Media Truth. We have been able to bring you uh, not only the introductory video and the 72-page document that describes uh, Clifford Carnicom's work with the Carnicom Institute for the last 20 years, uh, but part two, which includes a conversation with Dr. Carrie Madej and Clifford Carnicom, uh, where she's able to ask him questions, how did he isolate the virus, getting some more details, uh, and learning more uh, about uh, exactly what is this cross-domain bacteria that seems to be uh, ubiquitous throughout the environment, suspected maybe of being distributed through the chemtrails. Um, and now you've got part three with uh, Dr. Robert Young, 
Dr. Judy Mikovits uh, and attorney David Meiswinkle and the three of them together, uh, clearly asking him uh, the pertinent questions to really flush out exactly uh, where Clifford is at with this research uh, and to try to understand what we need to do to go to the, into the future with all of this uh, and the creation of the Carnicom Foundation. So uh, that is a total of, uh, of six plus hours worth of material. Um, all of it will be linked below. Uh, and um, we're kind of wrapping it up here. It's been a little bit of a long slog, but it's been well worth it. We're hoping to get the information out, as you just heard uh, David Meiswinkle saying, why isn't the public uh, allowed to know more about this? Certainly, uh, though there needs to be more research done, Clifford has uh, established through the scientific method uh, a lot of uh, well, he's raised a lot of questions uh, about what is this cross-domain bacteria that he's discovered, what is its relationship uh, to Morgellons disease, and exactly where is it coming from. Uh, as uh, was mentioned in the introductory video, uh, Clifford has gone to various government agencies and tried to ask them to look more deeply into this, uh, and they haven't. They've refused. He's been doing it on his own now uh, for a number of years. And uh, he is looking to get uh, basically a kind of a brain trust together and take the Carnicom Institute to the next level by creating the Carnicom Foundation. So if any of you are interested, if you want to find out more, or if you just uh, if you want to uh, actually become more actively involved, if you're a scientist or a lawyer or a journalist, please go to the Institute.org and get in touch with Clifford. Um, Clearly, we need to get what Clifford's isolated. Uh, we need to get that DNA sequenced. Uh, a little bit of the conversation with Dr. Mikovits was, was about this subject. Um, she may be able to help him find access to the kind of lab that he needs to get to uh, in order to be able to take this research to the next level and get that DNA sequenced. And then we can really find out what this is all about. Um, he really wants to create this transition now from him, you know, basically working alone in his lab to creating this foundation, getting more people involved, getting a little bit more funding and having more uh, expertise <coughs> that can look at the information that he's collated over the last 20 years and really take it to the next level. So uh, it was really uh, good to hear that Dr. Young has already been looking into this. He seemed really excited. He mentioned that uh, he was collecting samples from Houston and that he was uh, doing some work on his own. So um, we're trying to get people who are interested to come together over this. If you're listening to this, uh, as David Meiswinkle said, the public needs to know, please share this information on your own social media sites. Uh, get this information spread out far and wide. Um, I can tell you that uh, Transparent Media Truth is planning on doing follow-ups. We're hoping to get more and more people involved uh, and connected to Clifford uh, so that we can find out what's going on. Uh, as I mentioned uh, at the end of part two, but I'll just say it again, though Clifford doesn't make a lot of uh, presumptions about what's going on, it does appear that uh, these chemtrails may be being used not just for geoengineering, but for a type of bioengineering. What we've been seeing with Morgellons disease is the production inside the people that have this disease of uh, a, like a, a type of polymer-like substance that is a wiry-like uh, fibrous material that grows underneath the skin and then sometimes will poke through externally. Um, and we just don't know what's going on here. Is this some kind of a platform? We've certainly been hearing a lot. And as Dr. Mede brought up in part two, um, she is, is really expert on this transhumanist agenda. We've all, I think, heard a lot, uh, especially with the COVID thing going on uh, about um, and, you know, what, what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink. Certainly there's a big drive in the scientific community right now to connect humans into a sort of internet of biological things. <laughs> and uh, as crazy as it sounds, this technology is around, and we can only wonder if uh, there's a connection between this cross-domain bacteria that Clifford has been studying and Morgellons disease and this uh, larger transhumanist agenda that seems to be unfolding uh, as we speak. So again, getting more people interested and involved 
uh, more experts to be able to double check what Clifford has done and take this research into the future. That's the goal uh, of this disclosure project. So uh, if you're interested, again, please go to carnicominstitute.org and get in touch with Clifford. Or you can get in touch with us. Uh, you can email producer Rob Rubin of Transparent Media Truth at transparentmediatruth at gmail. And uh, you can get in touch with him there. And we'll be happy to connect you. Um, we will, again, be doing follow-ups. So thanks to everyone who's been checking out uh, all of this material. The, uh, the introductory video, the 72-page document, the transcript, um, part two, and now part three. Uh, this will give you a great overview of what's been going on. And again, go to carnicominstitute.org for more information. Uh, and there you'll find over 300 research papers that Clifford has put together over the past 20 years. So um, just want to say I've been your host. My name is Doug McKinty. You can find out all of my work at www.theshiftnow.com. I've got uh, oh, hundreds of hours of, of free content there, including 120 plus interviews that I've done uh, so far over the last several years that I've been doing radio and podcast work. Uh, and also, uh, don't hesitate to go to transparentmediatruth.com, where you can find all of the roundtable discussions that we've done, plus uh, all of the Carnicom Institute disclosure projects, parts uh, one through three, and all of the information associated all in one spot uh, at transparentmediatruth.com. If you want to get in touch with Rob, you can also get in touch with him uh, on Twitter at transparentmed1. And again, just want to thank everybody uh, for participating in this. Don't forget, in this age of shadow banning and censorship, uh, if you like what you're hearing, please uh, like, subscribe, and especially share on all of your social media sites uh, because we rely on listeners like you to help distribute this information. Thanks again for checking all of this out, and uh, we will keep you updated as, as things move forward from here. Take care, everybody. The opinions and ideas expressed in this roundtable discussion do not necessarily reflect the views of transparent media truth, but only those of the speakers participating in the discussion. Under the copyright disclaimer within Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowances are made for fair use of public content for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use.